students, Professor Marcelo Diaz had his master's degree at the FT, so he's a former colleague, colleague of, of us. And then he's had his PhD at University of Massachusetts Amherst. After he made a postdoctorate at Brown University. Nowadays, Professor Marcelo Diaz is an associate professor at Aarhus University. Is it right? Yes. Aarhus right. University at Denmark. His research focuses mainly on topics about theoretical mechanics and soft condensed matter. So, also, uh, just uh, another reminder, you feel free to, to write the questions during the, the talk. You're going to record them uh, during the, in the chat and then ask the professor after the talks finished. And professor, uh, can we record the, the talk? Yeah, that's totally fine. Okay, so... Let's begin. Professor, you have all the word, please. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mateus, for, uh, first of all, for the invitation. It's uh, absolutely a pleasure for me to somehow uh, be back at EFT and uh, Paulo Leal Ferreira at, uh, con at Congress. I, I, I participated in about uh, three of those events in the past. And uh, it's, uh, and it's again, a, a pleasure to, to be coming back. Uh, I, I would prefer to be in person there, but uh, I think the circumstances are obvious to all of us. So let's try to make the best out of the situation. Um, so since um, I was there in EFT, I, I've been uh, uh, working on a range of topics uh, concerning soft condensed matter physics um, and shape changing structures. And, and more and more, I, I drifted towards engineering and, and, and currently I'm trying to, you know, understand uh, problems and uh, the interface between engineering and physics. Uh, and today I'll tell you a little bit about uh, this, this journey of mine uh, uh, and, and a story in particular that has to do with uh, polymeric gels. Um, so, but before uh, we get to the main uh, core of the subject, uh, I would like to just give you a, a, a brief introduction on the sorts of things that I, that I care about. And, and, and somewhat, uh, things get summarized quite well uh, in this book by uh, Sir Darcy Thompson, who, who was a, a biologist and mathematician and he had already uh, back in 1917 uh, 19, uh, recognized uh, the idea that uh, the student of physical sciences and applied mathematics um, uh, had uh, the, the, the right approach to, to, to understand uh, problems of, of form in nature and, and understand morphological instabilities in nature. And as you can see from this example here, uh, this is uh, a phenomena on the bottom uh, on the bottom left corner. It's a phenomena called gastrulation, where it's uh, perhaps the most important event of your life. Uh, so this pretty much uh, determines uh, uh, at, at the beginning stages of 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 the of your uh, development uh, in the uterus. It, it basically through a mechanical instability, which is the buckling of the cell uh, from the outside to the inside, it determines which organs uh, will be uh, your internal organs and what will form uh, your exterior, your shell. And, and all of this, uh, if it's basically determined by a mechanical uh, phenomena, which is uh, pretty much uh, an, an instability or a bifurcation depends on, or a phase transition depends on uh, which background you, you, you come from. Um, and there are so many examples in nature uh, that uh, morphological instabilities are driven by mechanics. And, and pretty much the core of what I'll tell you today is it's about uh, trying to engineer some of these uh, morphological instabilities uh, uh, from uh, different aspects of polymeric physics. So uh, uh, I hope we will be able to, to tackle some of these examples and, and, and link back to the importance of uh, sort of observing how nature does some, some of these things and, and, and how we, we can 
take advantage of, of, of that for, for inspiration and, and actually to understand the intricacies of these types of mechanism. Um, so to begin with, I, I show you um, two experiments, uh, one uh, very well controlled uh, and um, done in a lab. So this is a polymeric thin sheet. Just think of this as a, a disc of a, very th of a very thin polymeric gel. And this is immersed in some solvent. And uh, this polymeric gel is uh, cross-linked uh, within its uh, microstructure uh, by this uh, polymer called NEPA, which is uh, a, a monomer. And this monomer basically uh, has the capability of uh, growing um, uh, or, ch or changing its shape internally, which uh, causes uh, the entire structure to create states of self-stress within uh, the polymer matrix and, and causing the structure to deform. And um, so basically this is what we, we observe. So we, we can uh, pretty much program the amount of cross-link inside of this thing sheet and turn the temperature up or down. Uh, and, and, and by doing so, you can uh, try to program a specific shape on this uh, polymeric gel. Um, and the idea is that uh, this is made thin enough that we are taking advantage of this third dimension. So you, you can think of this as a, as a uh, almost like a surface uh, embedded, uh, uh, two dimensional surface embedded in three dimensional space. And, and by controlling the internal forces or the stresses within uh, this polymeric gel, we, we, we would in principle be able to control its shape. But the challenge here really is uh, how do we program a specific uh, target uh, metric that, that we want, right? So we have a reference state and how do we get to a final uh, state uh, by, by manipulating the, uh, the chemistry. So I won't get into the chemistry very much, but you, you just have in mind that uh, we, we, we look at this from uh, a slightly a uh, higher level at the mechanical level, but we don't get into the intricacies of the chemistry. Uh, to give you another example, I did this in my own kitchen. So if you try to uh, fry up uh, yucca chips uh, or mangioca, as we say there, so basically you put this uh, flat disc on a hot oil and what's going on there is basically that the edges of the disc are, are heating up faster than the center and uh, that heating up process basically allows the, the, the yucca chip to absorb more oil faster at the edges than at the center. So the edges are growing faster than the center is growing. And that's why you get this ruffled shape, which uh, it's akin to what would be a hyperbolic plane, right? So you, you are basically growing the distances at the edge much faster than you have at the center. Right? So, and, and this is also a process of swelling, a process of control uh, shape change. Uh, so, but how, how do we get to understand this and put the mathematical underpinning? Uh, this is what this talk uh, will be about. So just another example that was uh, done in the group in which I, I did my PhD. So this is a very simple uh, situation where uh, they, they uh, cross-link these polymers with different intensity of UV light and the amount of exposure to UV light uh, determines the amount uh, of cross-link in a structure. So if you, if you expose for longer, um, uh, you will have more cross-links than if you expose it uh, less time uh, in certain parts. And that creates a, a gradient of the, um, the, the potential for the structure to, to, to adopt a specific shape locally. So you can start thinking of this as basically pre-programming the, the potential distances between material points that the structure will have in a target situation. So in other words, uh, when I put the mathematical on the pinning, this will be basically a control of the metric properties of the surface. So if I pretty much uh, get a, a surface with a low swelling ratio uh, in one end, which is this dark green area and the, and the high uh, swelling ratio, which is the light green area over here, 
uh, you pretty much observe uh, that these polymers, they can be uh, uh, controlled uh, in this particular manner. So uh, the mismatch between the two uh, densities of crosslink on each area causes this um, structure to roll up and, uh, and roll, roll up in, in uh, like in a fist kind of manner. And this is all reversible and controlled by temperature, right? So, so here you, you, you have basically the beginning of something that is slightly more controlled than uh, what I had shown before. So the challenge here is to be able to, again, uh, formalize this from a, a mathematical viewpoint and, and basically try to make a connection uh, of the amount of crosslink density with the metric that you would be able to prescribe uh, in, in a specific structure. So how does that uh, work from the mathematical viewpoints? Um, uh, a, a, little, a little more uh, formal uh, here uh, to some extent. Uh, so the, the theoretical modeling of, of growth uh, or swelling, right? So basically, you, uh, if you look at the bottom part of this diagram here, we have a stress-free st stress -free, free state, and you want to uh, arrive at a target configuration or a stress configuration. This, is, this would be here your final shape, right? But the mathematical formulation is, is such that uh, we, we go into a third configuration called uh, uh, the virtual uh, stress-free configuration. But uh, this configuration is slightly tricky to think about, uh, but uh, you have to think of this configuration as a configuration that is not, not possible to embed the metric in three-dimensional space. And then we allow for elastic relaxation to take place, and then the structure adopts its final state, right? So basically the way in which we measure uh, distances but between material points uh, relative to the uh, reference configuration on the current configuration is through a tensor called a strain tensor. And basically the strain tensor is constructed by uh, this uh, uh, gradient uh, mappings here, uh, uh, which uh, there are different measures of strains, but one of the measures of strains that we will be using will be basically F, F transpose, and then we measure uh, this relative to uh, the, the, the F, F transpose that takes you from the stress-free to this virtual configuration. So what I'm trying to say here is that we have a realizable metric, let's say the S square on the current configuration, and a metric uh, DS zero that is not realizable in 3D space, so it's not embeddable. And that encodes somehow this uh, distances between material points that are pre-programmed before the hydrogel is activated by temperature. So another way of thinking about this is basically imagine that you have a, a plate and you cut a square out of it. And then uh, you insert a trapezoid in between, like a trapezoid that has an area is slightly larger than the, the cutout that you, that you had before. So this intermediate vi virtual configuration is a state in which you inserted this trapezoid, but you force this plate to remain flat, planar. So as you can imagine, this will be a fully stress, stress situation because as, as soon as you release your, your hands uh, to stop forcing the situation to be in this virtual configuration, uh, you would observe buckling because there is more distances uh, on the on the outer edge of the trapezoid than uh, it used to be in the cutout. And this is what we call uh, the non-Euclidean uh, uh, formalism to talk about structures that undergo growth or swelling, uh, basically that have in states of internal stresses that lead to uh, some uh, out of plane configuration in, in the case of thin sheets, right? So, how do we uh, take this uh, uh, from a more formal point of view, borrowing ideas from elasticity? So here, I just want to give you a roadmap uh, of, of, of dimensional reduced models of elasticity. So in the real world here, we, we always deal with th three-dimensional elasticity. Uh, uh, objects are in, 
uh, obviously in nature are three dimensional, but we are going to make certain approximations in order to be able to have some sort of progress or deal with the equations in a way that, uh, that it would be easier to handle. And this process is called dimensional reduction, which is pretty much taking a three-dimensional theory of elasticity and arriving at a 2D theory of elasticity, which is basically an energy functional that penalizes uh, uh, the energy of the mid plane or the surface instead of uh, a volume three-dimensional energy. So just to get everybody up to speed, uh, so uh, we, in, in, in in this formulation, we, we deal with uh, a few elements. These elements are kinematics, which gives you the relationship between the strain and the displacement of the material points. We have constitutive law that gives you a relationship between stress inside of the material and strain. So basically, this constitutive law is your equivalent of Hooke's law, right? So it's just relating the amount of internal forces with the amount of internal displacements through elastic constants, in this case here, Young's modulus and Poisson ratio. Uh, and then we have a three-dimensional energy functional, which is uh, uh, penalizing uh, the amount of strain that you find inside of the material, right? And if you take the variation of this energy, you find the balance equations, which is the gradient of stress equal goes to the amount of uh, external forces applied in the system. So we can do this process of dimensional reduction by making an asymptotic expansion of, about the thickness of, of, of a slab. And we can arrive at uh, an energy function after this appropriate expansion that is uh, penalizing uh, the, 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 the surface energy rather than uh, the, 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 the bulk volume energy. And this energy comes into two flavors and I'll get into more details what they are right now. So once you have a dimension appropriate dimension the reduced model, your elastic strain energy comes into these two flavors, stretching plus bending. Uh, the interesting thing here that due to this asymptotic expansion and, and the fact that you integrated out the degrees of freedom across the thickness of this material, stretching is proportional to thickness and uh, bending is proportional to thickness cube. And you can kind of intuitively see this because if you, if you take a thin slab, you can see that it's much easier to bend the slab than it is to stretch the slab, right? So, uh, so due to the fact that um, bending scales with thickness cube and thickness is the smallest dimension of your problem, uh, um, it's much easier to bend than it is to stretch. So basically what stretching is penalizing uh, is the, the difference between metrics with respect to reference and target space. And what bending is penalizing is basically the curvatures, right, involved in your system. Right. So, uh, so then once again, uh, if you go from a reference configuration to, to a target configuration, you would uh, penalize stretching by taking uh, uh, by measuring the, the two metrics or the distances between material points on the two configurations. And the curvature are basically, if you look at a surface, you sit at a point and then you move around, you can find uh, the, 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 the surface curve curves in, in, in all directions. You can make a local decomposition, which is basically diagonalizing uh, the the, the, the curvature tensor and you find the principal directions of curvature. And from this, uh, from this tensor, you can extract two invariants. Uh, one of them is called the mean curvature, which is basically the mean of the two principal directions and the Gaussian curvature, which is the product. So while stretching is penalizing difference between material points, bending is penalizing uh, the curvature. So that comes into these two flavors here, mean curvature square and Gaussian curvature square. For those who can make an analogy with the Einstein-Hubert uh, formulation, um, um, basically uh, the problem of elasticity is that uh, this, the surfaces, they, they, they have an ambient space, they are embedded somewhere. And, and in such case, uh, uh, you need to keep track of both intrinsic and extrinsic elements. Uh, so they both need to be penalized. And that's why uh, you have both the mean and Gaussian curvature here in this case, because mean curvature is what we call the extrinsic uh, contribution and Gaussian curvature is the intrinsic contribution. 
and at the same time add the stretching energy because the material points they they go further apart from each other or closer together depending whether the the the, the representative volume element is either intention or compression uh, you also need to keep track of uh, two different manifolds and penalize the difference between the material points on these two different manifolds. And then uh, the formalism of non-Euclidean plates, which it accounts for this uh, uh, multiplicative decomposition that I spoke formally about, that has this uh, intermediate virtual configuration, enters uh, in the fact that the reference configuration is not the embedded uh, a real configuration, but uh, rather it's the configuration that has that metric encoded. It's the configuration that has already uh, the information that the material points are going to be further apart by a certain amount. And, and that leads to frustration because uh, uh, this, uh, due to the, the, the grouse Grigan theorem, you can relate uh, the amount of uh, metric in, in a state uh, with its uh, Gaussian curvature. So this uh, reference configuration already knows that uh, there is a certain amount of Gaussian curvature that needs to be resolved uh, in when uh, the, the, the configuration is released in space and is allowed to buckle and release its stresses to the final situation. So this is uh, sort of uh, the way in which I see uh, uh, the, the formalism. And, and from now on, this also sets the language that we, we use about, uh, go, going forward. So I will be talking a lot about this stretching and bending energy. So that you remember that I'm talking about these two energetic contributions. Okay, so uh, we've, we've done a few things uh, uh, in order to uh, tell the, the experimentalists how to uh, program their polymers. And basically we are solving uh, the problem, the inverse problem, which is uh, given uh, a certain number of target configurations uh, that one would like to, to achieve, uh, how can you prescribe uh, a, a swelling factor or this uh, conformal factor in this metric here? So on, on the disk, on the annulus or the disk such that you achieve this shape, right? So I, I hope that the question is clear here. So I, I repeat myself. So given um, a certain number of target shapes that you want to achieve and that your initial configuration is going to be either an analyst or a disk, what is the metric that one needs to prescribe in order to attain this shape, right? So that's what the experimentalist wants to know because uh, the experimentalist really can play around with this factor omega here, which is this conformal factor in front of the, of, of the reference metric, because that relates to the amount of cross links that the experimentalist would have to program in this polymers in order to be able to activate this metric, right? So, so then we, we did just that. So I, I, I spare you of the calculations, but the fact is that uh, depending on the thickness of your sample, you're going to have uh, a, a specific uh, conformal factor. And notice here that the, all the shapes are axisymmetric in order to make our lives a bit easier to demonstrate the principle, but it's, it's quite general nevertheless. Um, but we, we can tell the experimentalists how to prescribe, uh, how to, to work with this, uh, with this information in order, to, uh, uh, in order to swell the shape or the polymer in the way uh, he or she wants. So now I show you some examples of uh, that they actually did by using our theory. So basically the way they did that, they, they, they had a photo mask, which is uh, just a bunch of dots uh, on this, uh, a bunch of holes. And they programmed the metric uh, on this uh, little gels with these dots. It more or less works like uh, the old newspaper print uh, where you have this uh, gradient of, uh, of dots that, tell, that, that gives you the shape in which you, you see it popping up in three dimensions, right? So basically that's what they did in order to uh, program this metric that we can give it to them. Um, and here, what you see, those are the actual experimental uh, pictures. So they, they've been able to program uh, saddle shapes, uh, saddles uh, or spherical caps or conical shapes 
And the most interested, uh, interesting of all are these shapes here on the bottom. And those are what we call uh, minimal surfaces. Uh, minimal surfaces are surfaces of uh, zero mean curvature. And as you can see here, the measure of mean curvature of the surfaces, they are pretty much zero except for the edge, the boundary. But in that particular case, the, 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 the difference is that uh, the boundary, there is going to be a phenomena called boundary layer. And, and we can still capture that phenomena by doing singular perturbation theory. However, uh, for, all, uh, uh, for all sakes and purposes, uh, for the first approximation, uh, the, uh, the metric that we could give it to them of a minimal surface worked uh, pretty well. So what are the limitations of this theory? The limitations are that uh, this theory is thickness dependent, dependent and uh, uh, the, the thinner um, uh, you make, uh, the thicker you, sorry, the thicker you make this, uh, this, this polymers, the more resolution you're going to need. So you see here that the thicker uh, uh, calculation is this uh, solid uh, black line over here on the top. And then there is this huge variation on the metric right above 0 0.6 uh, out of the radius. And, and that variation is very difficult to capture with the resolution that they have to print those photo masks. So it, it starts to become quite challenging to, to program the shape if the, 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 the surfaces uh, get thick enough. So what are the alternatives and can we do something else? Uh, or, uh, and, 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 and can we also improve on yet another limitation that I forgot to mention, which has to do with the fact that this uh, shape changes are quite slow uh, because they are swelling driven. And swelling is basically diffusion of solvent through the elastic, the polymer matrix. And diffusive time scales are, are quite slow. Um, well, in comparison to what you may ask, but they are slow for some types of applications that people have in mind. So, so can we do better than this? So this is the question. And this is the thing that I try to kind of address with other types of materials coming up. So what is the, the design space that we have to face then? Uh, if, you, if you want to be able to address uh, some of these problems and, and be able to move further uh, in, the, in, in the process of shape change. So there are three things that we have to concern ourselves with. Oh, there are way more, of course. When experimentalists come to the picture, I mean, like this becomes insane, the amount of things that we really need to think about. But uh, for a theorist, let me just uh, basically make my life easier here and say that I have to worry about elasticity, which is basically, uh, I go from soft to rigid. So I need to be able to uh, think about shape change in that, uh, in that axis. There is the, 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 the length scale, right? So you want to go small or large, and there is the time scale, how fast you want to go. And all these examples here that I'm showing, uh, somehow uh, some of these problems are addressed, and here are just the references for you to go see uh, what they are. So the, the, the length scale here, you can actually go larger than this polymers here. I forgot to explicitly mention, but the figure that I showed before had a, 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 bar, a scale bar, but these guys over here are 300 micrometers or so, right? And, and, and there are different types of actuations that you can have uh, at different scales, but the principle that I'm laying out here is basically the same principle. And, and here the time scale is uh, what you saw. Uh, let me just run this again. This is an emetic leak the crystal elastomer and it's actuated by light. So it works much faster than diffusive time scales. And this is what I will be focusing on uh, from, the, for, from now until the end of this uh, presentation. So pneumatic leak crystal elastomers, they, they resolve this problem of, of uh, time scale because uh, again, they, they can also be activated by light and the phase transformations uh, uh, driven by light actuation are much faster than the ones driven by swelling, which are the diffusive uh, forces within the system. And they compare the order of magnitude of light actuations 10 to the minus three seconds, where swelling happens at the, at the scale of uh, 10 seconds. 
So, and the other thing is that there are more degrees of freedom uh, for the pneumatic liquid crystal elastomer, as we will see, and I will hopefully define this clearly what the pneumatic liquid crystal, what all these words mean in, in just a second, actually in this slide. So what is a liquid crystal? So liquid crystal is basically a liquid made out of uh, rod-like molecules. And uh, there are three phases, uh, uh, well, there are more phases, uh, but basically here are the phases of, of liquid crystals that, that you can have in case you have a pneumatic. So there are other types of liquid crystals like somatic or blue phases, but here we focus on pneumatic. And pneumatic is just a bunch of rod-like molecules if you are in the isotropic phase, so a high temperature. And as you cool down due to some entropic effects, these rod-like molecules, they will tend to align with each other. And when you break that symmetry, right, in space, uh, this is what we call a pneumatic liquid crystal. And if you freeze more, and then you just have a crystal. But something in between is neither uh, a, liquid, a liquid nor a crystal. All right, it, it is something in between because it has broken at least one of the symmetries of the system, which is uh, the, the, the head and tail regarding to the orientation of these molecules, right? So this is an emetic liquid crystal. Uh, and these rod-like molecules, are, are, uh, they tend to be rigid. They can face transform, uh, but we'll, we'll just give you an example later. But uh, for any sake, uh, sake of, of, of simplification here, just think of them as rigid-like molecules. And what is a pneumatic liquid crystal elastomer. An elastomer is just basically a bowl of spaghetti that has been stuck for some time and that is cross-linked, right? So basically long polymer chain. And this is your rubber, it's your eraser. Uh, it's like just the common rubber that you find anywhere. But the pneumatic liquid crystal elastomer is, is a rubber that has uh, embedded within the backbone of this uh, polymer chains, this rod-like molecules. And the interesting thing about this, that now there is a, a coupling between elasticity and, and the, the, the order parameter that describes uh, the pneumatic phase. And, and we will see how that works in a second. So basically when you have this isotropic phase disorder for pneumatic liquid crystal elastomers, you could stimulate stretching by basically aligning the rod-like molecules, right? And basically within the microstructure of this, you have this uh, mesogen, which are the pneumatic molecules, the polymer backbone and the cross linkers. And that makes it all together, this uh, pneumatic liquid crystal elastomer. And this thing now opens a new lack of a new, a new uh, uh, field of, of, of applications because it, it can be actuated by different external stimuli such as temperature, light, uh, electric and magnetic field or mechanical strain. So here are some examples. So uh, this, this pneumatic elastomers, they are widely used or at least conceptually used as artificial muscles because you, they can, you can heat and cool them down and they can uh, sustain mechanical load, right? Um, and they can also change shape when actuated by uh, some electric field or light, right? By changing the conformation of the molecules uh, of this pneumatic molecule inside of the, this polymer. So the way that I see this thing here is that you can prepare the sample in, in a few ways. So the way that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of for the, the types of applications that I'm interested in is the following. So you have your spaghetti bowl with these polymers, they are not yet cross-linked. And then you have a bunch of uh, pneumatic molecules sort of uh, mixed within uh, this, this mass. And then you cool down. So through entropic effects, both the polymer and the pneumatic will tend uh, to align, right? And then you throw the, the cross-linking agent there and you cross-link this thing and the pneumatic phase. By doing so, you prepare a reference order parameter, right? And the order parameter for a pneumatic, since these guys are headless vectors, has to be a two-point tensor. So this is going to be n times n minus one over three delta ij, delta is just the chronic delta. So, and then you can now uh, stretch this thing, apply mechanical forces, or you can actuate this by some external stimuli and bring this pneumatic or the parameter to a final configuration. 
And the question is, how do we couple that to elasticity? Because there is also this polymer backbone, right? And the gen, which is, uh, an, uh, I think, perhaps the only Nobel Prize in, uh, in soft matter that has worked in soft matter, um, uh, and also superconductivity and all sorts of things. Uh, so he proposed this energy, which is a minimal uh, uh, energy for the 3D block of this material, which is your, this first term here would be your usual elasticity, just coupling between stress and strain. The new term would be the coupling between uh, the difference of order parameter and strain. And then uh, the, the next uh, term is going to be the pneumatic pneumatic, sorry, the pneumatic pneumatic coupling, right? So three terms again, elasticity, elasticity plus pneumatic, and then pneumatic pneumatic, right? So and here there is a minus sign because actually what this is telling you is that if the pneumatic aligns with the principal directions of strain, you are reducing the energy, right? So that's important to remember. So people started to look at thin films of this pneumatic liquid crystal elastomers and all sorts of interesting properties and shapes were able to be achieved. And, and this is what we, we had the challenge on. We, we had this uh, three-dimensional theory for pneumatic liquid crystal elastomers, but no one had ever proposed uh, a dimensionally reduced model that accounts for this uh, coupling with internal degrees of freedom. So, so here is uh, what we, we took the challenge to try to put forward the theory that could account just for exactly that. So uh, the dimensional reduction process goes as follows. So you have your uh, three-dimensional energy. And uh, if you look at locally, uh, your pneumatic, uh, the assumption here, the simplifying assumption for the pneumatic is that uh, this pneumatic is, are going to be aligned with respect to some reference plane, which is this red plane. And uh, the pneumatic on any other surface above the mid plane, so you think of this as a foliation up until the bottom and top surface of, the, of, your, of your sheet. Professor? Yes? Uh, sorry for interruption, but just to remind you, you have about 10 minutes of presentation, okay? Okay. We still good. have yeah. 10 minutes left. Sounds Thank good. You. So I'll try to finish uh, by then. I, I'll probably have to skip a few things because I, I took some more time on, on other things, but yeah, it's fine. So. All right, so you have this, uh, this, um, this uh, parallelism across this different, uh, uh, this different sheets uh, with respect to the mid plane. It, it, it doesn't have to be the case. In fact, we can perform the dimensional reduction for more generalized cases, but I'm going to assume for sake of simplicity here that the pneumatic is going to be parallel across this foliation. So then the embedding of any material point within three-dimensional space is going to be with respect to some mid-plane S, which is the red surface, and then some coordinate along the thickness and that goes along the norm, right? So this is the way uh, we, we set the direction here. So, and then you can make an expansion uh, of the measure. Right? Uh, so the measure is the area times the X3, which is go goes along the, the norm over here. And then the strain in three dimensions, as well as the pneumatic order parameter in three dimensions can be expanded about this uh, third smaller direction. And, and this, this expansion comes in uh, 2D strain. This is the difference between matrix. This B here is the curvature tensor, right? So you have the, first, the second fundamental form here. And then here is the coupling of the second fundamental form with itself, which is some people call the third fundamental form. And then the pneumatic is going to couple with curvature as well. So the, the toy vision of all of this is basically that uh, the pneumatic now is going to, if you apply in-plane strains, the pneumatic can realign with the in-plane strain, but it also aligns with principal directions of curvature. And then after you, you integrated out this third degree of freedom in the, in the, in the, in the, along the normal direction, oops, you have also stretching and bending energy with, with renormalized uh, elastic constants, right? That are now anisotropic because there is this internal degree of freedom that prefers a direction. 
right? So I won't go into the details here for sake of time, but if as long as you keep this, uh, this picture in mind, and then that should be fine. So the first example that we looked is, uh, if you solve the Euler Lagrange equation for the pneumatic, you'll see right away that if you have uh, alignment between the Euler parameter and the strain, and then if, if you plug this, this back into this equation, uh, uh, into the full uh, 2D energy, you're going to recover the usual stretching plus bending energy. And then you can ask yourself, well, but where did the pneumatic go? The pneumatic went with, within this uh, renormalized stiffness tensors N and, and S and then B. And uh, here they are. So these are these U vectors over there. So if that is the case, uh, we're going to look at an even simpler example here where we don't stretch, where we simply bend uh, the, the, the material, right? And then we're going to assume that this material is incompressible. So in case we have zero stretch in situation, uh, you, can, you can achieve that by a simple relationship between the elastic constants and the coupling constants of pneumatic, uh, pneumatic and, and pneumatic uh, strain energy. And then the only minimizer of all of this story here is going to be the bending energy. So right now we are minimizing something akin to, to the einstein hubert uh, action over here, which is just penalizing curvature. But again, we have also intrinsic and extrinsic. So if that is the case, we can uh, look at two particular ansets over here. So I'm going to choose my metric of the final configuration such that it's given by two fields. Um, so, uh, and I can talk in details later why this, this, this ansatz is, but it's just that uh, it's a specific choice of coordinate system in which the, the first and second fundamental form are, are represented. So G is the first fundamental form, B is the curvature and tensor, second fundamental form, so it's written like so. And we want to manipulate the orientational order in the plane in order to change the shape over here. So if we plug this into the energy and we minimize the energy, we find the relationship between uh, this field K1, K2, which are the principal directions of curvature, and the omega, which has to do with the metric. So how do we, we have three variables here, right? And only one equation uh, that came from minimizing the energy. So what do we do now? Do we just uh, sit and cry? Now we, we, we basically look at integrability of the system and integrability of the system, uh, which is integrability of surfaces, uh, uh, two dimensional surfaces in three dimensional space is going to be uh, given by the, what we call the uh, gauss weingarten equation. And if, if those uh, integrability equations are satisfied, and then we are ensuring that the final target configuration has an embedding, that that surface exists. So if you, if you take this integrability equations here, I would just put forward, if you just rewrite this uh, in terms of the field variables that we had, we get these two equations here. And these equations have analytic solutions in terms of elliptic functions. And so I, I would just kind of flash this through. But the point is that now we can rewrite uh, everything in terms of the pneumatic field and change uh, the orientation of the pneumatic. And that is going to be coupled with uh, the, the, the fields that describe both the curvature and the metric of the surface. And basically that's what I'm doing here. I'm changing one of these parameters and as I change the orientation of the pneumatic, so blue used to be the reference configuration and red is the target configuration of the pneumatic. And, then, and here on the side is the shape that corresponds to that choice of orientation of pneumatic. And here I'm just plotting uh, the Gaussian and mean curvature. So all the surfaces that I'm, that I'm going through here by tuning these parameters are surfaces of constant Gaussian curvature. And, and yeah, so, and then you, you can change uh, another parameter and you get slightly different surfaces. So I won't go through this in, in detail, but I'll just tell you that there exists another ansatz uh, related to Chebyshev nets. And that is very interesting because uh, the integrability equations leads to a sine Gordon equation. And that's, uh, that's a well-known uh, class of integrability. And we can find a, a whole 
the set of surfaces within this class of integrability that has to do with the sign garden. So just to finally conclude here, um, I think the pneumatic, as I said at the beginning, it opens doors to um, a lot of new ways of looking at shape change. And, it, and it's interesting because there exists this internal degree of freedom that can be manipulated uh, and it can also couple with elasticity. And a lot of people are interested in, uh, in these things in order to design um, micro robots and, and, and things that can have fast actuation, thus the, the, the need to move forward from swelling because we need fast actuation if you, if you want to have any succeed in, in designing locomotion, engineering locomotion and transport at the micro scale. Um, and there are a bunch of interesting morphological instabilities that we, we can think of that are not as simple as just in isotropic materials that could be playing a role also in, in, in biological systems because a lot of biological systems are not isotropic. And the pneumatic accounts for this departure from an, uh, from an isotropy that you have in previous models. I just want to quickly tell you briefly my group and some acknowledgements here. Uh, so my research, uh, as I said, uh, it broad, it's broad in the sense of mechanics and, and stability of structures and softness matter. There are a lot of things that we, we are interested in the group. Um, the research methods are analytical methods uh, and some, some simulation, but we are also interested in, in, in tabletop experimentation as well. So uh, funding uh, for this currently uh, over here, just to acknowledge them. Uh, there are other types of problems that we are interested, uh, such as mechanical math materials and 3D printing lattices with uh, complex geometries. Um, we are interested in origami mechanics, which is just folding paper. We are interested in Kirigami, which is cutting paper. And a lot of this is to sort of improve and open up more space for thinking of materials uh, and what we hope to be a, a smart way uh, and, and bringing in uh, different elements of geometry and soft uh, matter systems to uh, the, 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 the way that we think about materials for, for the future. Um, so, and with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your talk, Marcelo Azevedo. And now we have time for questions. The first question is from Gabriel Soares. Gabriel Soares, do you, do you want to, to speak, please? Um, hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for, for the, the talk. Uh, I was just, uh, if, I, if I understood well, uh, you mentioned that the numeric polym uh, the numeric polymer uh, had applications with uh, as an artificial muscle. Yes. I, I was thinking about the biocompatibility of these materials. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So this is a it's a good question because uh, this is. Uh, can you still see my slide, by the way? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, so this is a good question because uh, definitely this, this is a concern, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so I must confess that uh, right now, uh, a lot of these uh, things that people have been thinking about, they are on a, on a drawing board, right? But uh, the fact that uh, you can achieve these materials uh, uh, by using uh, polymers and, and, and there are off the counter polymers that are biocompatible already, then that shouldn't be an issue. But there is, uh, in fact, a, a technology problem here, which is that uh, would all the available polymers that can undergo shape change be biocompatible? That's, that's a trickier question, right? But, but definitely, like uh, biocompatibility, is, it's, it's, a, it's an area on its own right. Uh, but, um, but again, I, I just close by saying that uh, polymers are, are known to, to, to have this uh, niche where they can also be biocompatible. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, we have a question from Luis Fernando Fultura. 
Please, Luis Fernando, if you like, you can speak. Um, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was brilliant. Uh, my question is, are these changes in shape reversible if one recreates the initial environmental conditions the materials were subjected to? Yeah, so uh, exactly. So this is assuming that things uh, will... Uh, somewhat uh, remain the same. Uh, but for example, in this case that I'm showing in the slide here, uh, the, the shape change is strongly coupled with uh, the, the temperature. So you can imagine that you could thermalize these things back to its initial environmental uh, temperature. Uh, and the other element here would be uh, the solution in which these uh, structures are embedded to begin with and the amount of salt concentration, et cetera. So, um, and those polymers are sensitive to that. So if there, if there is, uh, for example, a pH change in the environment that could uh, affect uh, the, the reversibility process. However, you can also think of that as not as a, as a fault in the system, but you can use that in your advantage as well because you could actually program different shapes uh, linked to the, the environmental conditions. But, um, but yeah, so uh, I think the, the answer to your question is depends uh, and, and, and depends on these nuances that I'm speaking of. Yeah. Thank you so very I, much. You know, one more thing, sorry. Uh, one more thing is regarding uh, this specific shape change here, which is uh, light actuated uh, and basically as long as you can shine uh, the same wavelength you're going to recover the same C strands back and forth because the energy landscape there is well defined right so yeah thank you very much for your answer yeah thank you now we have a question from Marcos Vinicius please Marcos Vinicius oh hi Marcelo uh, I'm not. I'm not from from this area, from condensed matter or materials. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm more from high energy physics. But uh, one question popped in my mind when you you use that uh, Gauss Weingarten integrability conditions. Yes. Uh, they they are they are equivalent to equivalent conditions on metric and connection and all the all the parameters you use, right? Yes. Yes. So and uh, so when you use this integrability condition uh, when you deal uh, deal with the metric of material or, or any other parameter of the material, you are imposing or I know assuming that you don't have crystalline effects. Yeah. So I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that. Uh, can Can you elaborate just a little more on um, on this? I don't know. Uh, it's because I, I for 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 some time I studied this uh, crystalline defects in materials. Oh, okay, got it. No, I got what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> certainly. Okay, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, interesting. So, uh, the, so the answer to to your question is yes. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I am assuming that uh, my 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 connection is metric, right? So that I can write my connection entirely from the metric here. So, but however, uh, there are types of materials that they have internal defects. And as you already alluded to, uh, mm -hmm. if, if you have, for instance, dislocations and disclinations, this could not yes. be captured by, by this formalism. And then you would need to have a, 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 a more elaborated system. So for instance, if you, you, you can have, for instance, screw dislocation in a material, which looks like a parking lot, Right, so it's like a, yeah, yeah, uh, right. if if you go over a, a, a spiral case, for example, there is a screw dislocation going across through the center of the material, and and yeah. that you would need to have torsion to describe that as well. But it's not yeah. the case here. So the, the, to simplify my life, yes, you're you're absolutely correct. I I, yeah, totally. I am assuming that there are no crystalline defects. Yes. So to, totally understandable. It, it, it really is makes it really more difficult. Yeah, no, but so, it's possible. Uh, you see, it's the, the possibilities are there open for that, and there are people looking at uh, this this nuances as well. Yeah, and, and I can probably point you to some references in there. Yeah. Oh, 
Nice, nice. I like it. I like it. Uh, uh, one, just one, one more thing. I went. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you experimentally. I, I don't know if you work with this experimental part directly, but I my doubt is if if you can if you can force uh, all your process to create a, uh, I don't know vengeable or neglectable crystalline effects when you work with it with this kind of experiments. I don't know mm -hmm. if, uh, how, how much you create in, in normal procedures and processes, but yeah. well, okay, that's my, my doubt. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think the, well, so, so there is a lot to, to unpack there, but for the interest of time, I think I will say a, a couple of things. One of them is that uh, polymers are, are a long chain molecules and, uh, and, and they don't usually uh, create this types of defects they like they they just kind of are sort of amorphous within uh its microstructure so nice. it's like i like i usually say a bowl of spaghetti with uh just <laughs> polymers all, all over the place as such but the, the, what comes to mind as you are saying these things and, and it's sort of new to me to think about this is that uh the pneumatic itself can create this defect right uh, and it would be interesting to couple this because, and then you have, uh, and then you have a, a somewhat, uh, uh, so your pneumatics would be obeying somewhat akin to a non Riemannian uh, metric, but your polymer is this amorphous things and, and, and how they couple with each other could be interesting because you could create defects out of this. And moreover, like I, I only spoke about pneumatics. I didn't spoke. I speak about uh, somatic phases, and somatic phases can have this uh, crystalline order effect in them. So, oh, nice, nice, really yeah. interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. We have one one last question. It's from Benjamin. Benjamin, please. Yeah, so thank you very much for the talk. I think it's fascinating, just fantastic yeah. all the way through. And, and just a very open question, right? Mm -hmm. When you, just at the start of the talk, you mentioned the, the work of Darcy Thompson and these, which was yeah. sort of one of the main motivators for the whole field of, of soft matter. And one of the mm -hmm. I, I'm classical, I don't know, first mathematical implementations of these principles that was indeed inspired by this approach of Darcy was in the by the 60s to 80s and so on by people in dynamical systems like and, mm -hmm. and algebraic geometry like Hene Tom and then people like that who were yes, studying yeah. catastrophe theory and is there a precise connection between this formalism of of, of geometry right differential geometry and that of more dynamical systems and, and uh, algebraic topology that they, sorry, algebraic geometry that they were using. Mm -hmm. Is there some way to draw a connection here? A formal yeah, way? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the answer to this is absolutely yes. And, and in fact, uh, Rene Tom has a book on, on growth. But I, 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 I don't remember the title right now yet, but it's growth and morphological instability, something like this from Rene Tom. And um, and the the connection is uh, it's 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 remarkable in fact uh, that these people were uh, as they formulated the concept of instability, right? And and how those are the same instabilities that that you observe in your dynamical systems, right? So for example, if I uh, I don't know if you guys can see my hand here, but I have a thin slab, right? And then if I compress it, it buckles like so, right? So this process here of buckling of a, of a thin structure is, is a pitchfork bifurcation, right? So, and, and there are other types of, of, of bifurcations that you can observe and instabilities in mechanical systems that are the same that you see uh, in, in dynamical systems and they can be mapped in a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship, right? So you have things like propagating stabilities like the types of phase transformations that you see in, in, in uh, Maxwell, uh, Maxwell transition, uh, you can have uh, uh, limit pointing stabilities, which are snapping transitions in mechanical systems. 
so there, there, there is this uh, analogy for sure. And that's the language, the appropriate language to describe these things. Uh, and that's where, what the, 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 the things that Darcy Thompson was mentioning in his book about instabilities were later uh, formalized within this context, right? So, yeah. So thank you once more for the very good talk, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Um, yeah. We'd like to ask you if you can uh, let available the, the slides for the presentation. Mm -hmm. So, and then you, you, you would like me to just uh, drop it off in the Slack, I guess, is that what you guys are using? Yes, in the Slack. Okay, yeah, that's fine, mm -hmm. yeah. Also, I'd like to uh, make a reminder for everyone that we are also uh, putting the slides uh, 